Hello and welcome to Chit Chat with Jed and Co, the show where everyone has their say. Today's show comes from the Go Glasgow Urban Hotel. Could you please subscribe free to our YouTube channel and give us a like? Now today's guest needs little or no introduction. He started his illustrious career at Kilmarnock, he then moved on to Rangers, he then played in an FA Cup final, scored and missed for Brighton Hove Albion, he then moved on to Manchester City where he played under the late great Billy McNeil. He then finished his career abroad in Austria and Switzerland and then became a football agent before getting to the pinnacle of Scottish football in 2007 when he was named CEO of the SFA. He's a man of many talents. Welcome to the show, Gordon Smith. Thank you, Jed. Good to see you. It's great to have you here, Gordon. Now, as I, I rhymed off there, you've had a wonderful career in football. But was football always your passion, Gordon, even from a young age? Yeah, it certainly was from a young age. Yeah, I was brought up in a, a council estate in Stevenston and uh, you know, most of the time uh, you were out in the streets playing with your pals and the playground at school you're allowed to play in those days. So from a very early age I was dedicated to football and uh, you know, my grandfather had been a player. My grandfather had played for Kilmarnock, won two Scottish Cups but he was dead before I was born. So I never ever got to meet him but it was maybe a little bit of an inspiration to me, the fact that he'd been a player but I was determined to be one. And it's quite interesting when you talk to young kids because I've been a, a few coaching things and you say, you know, like, who wants to be a player? All the hands go up and you say, who thinks they'll be a player? And very few hands go up. And I th always say, that's wrong. You, you've actually got to believe in it yourself. And I did. I had this belief from an early age as well that I was going to be a player. And it went through even when people were saying, no, you won't make it. School teachers would say, what are you going to be when you grow up? I'd say, a footballer. No, you won't be one. What, what, you need to have something else. And I would say, no, I'm going to be a footballer because I was determined to be one. Now, I also worked very hard at it, Jed. I used to practice a lot on my own, uh, you know, working on my both feet, and I became two-footed player because of it, because I was determined to get better and be as good a player as I could possibly be. And I think that I'm not quite sure yet how much of my talent at the time was natural and how much was just because of the work I put in. Despite being signed professionally by Kilmarnock, Gordon, I know it's very important to you, and you continued with your education. Yeah, I continued my education uh, because my mum was very determined that I, I was getting educated. She was the, the, the person behind me in that respect, wanting me to do well at school. And at, at one time, she even threatened me to stop me playing football if I wasn't uh, passing my exams. So that uh, actually gave me the incentive and the motivation to do the education. But I did feel it was right. And I, I thank her now because, at the, say, at the time, you know, I was just thinking, football, football, I'm going to be a football player. But when I looked at it, she did me a big favour by making sure that I did my education too. Rangers uh, bought you in 1977, Gordon. Had you completed your studies by then? Um, I had just completed my studies, actually. Uh, when I went to do my degree, uh, I came home. I was working at the time. I was 18 years of age, and I was in the command of first team when I was at school. I was already playing in the, in the first team, and my, one of my teammates was my PE teacher at the school, George <laughs> Maxwell which was quite a, unusual. Yeah. And uh, so I was thinking I was going to go full-time at 18. I came home from a little summer job I had. My mum said, uh, there's your dinner's ready. She said, and there's your acceptance. I said, my acceptance for what? She said, your degree. I said, I never applied, mum. She said, no, I did. She'd applied to put me on a degree course. So <laughs> I had to do it then, basically, because my mum would put me on to it. So I did a BA business studies. And I just finished, I was still playing for Comana. I just finished my BA and I got appointed as a, a marketing uh, development manager for a company in Glasgow, Edward McNeil Limited, a packaging company, and I was a marketing development manager. I was two weeks in the job when um, the phone rang in the office, and I picked it up, and it was the commandant manager, Willie Fernie. He said, where are you? And I said, well, you've rung me. You should know where I am. And he said, no. He said, uh, your secretary, the secretary gave me the number. I said, I'm in Glasgow at my work. He said, you far from Ibrox? I said, no, why? He said, just sold you at Rangers. <laughs> It's incredible. I'll see you there in half an hour. That's yeah. what he said. And I went, okay. So I went to my bosses and I said, eh, I've, excuse me, I've just got to nip out for a little while here. I've got something I've got to deal with. They went, okay. I went along to Ibrox. And to be fair, where I, I, I was working was five minutes from Ibrox. Got there, met Jock Wallace, the Rangers manager, and uh, signed, signed the contract. That, that's, that's really incredible. Your first season at Rangers went really well. Was that a special time for you, Gordon? It was a great season. I mean, I, I fitted in well right away, which was very lucky. I mean, the, the, the team had, had lost the first couple of league games when I signed. And, uh, well, it, it lost the first one before I signed. And then 
at the, I was just a substitute when they played the second one, they lost. So I got put in the team after that, and it worked out really well because we went on a run and I was scoring goals, and uh, it was fantastic. So that first season, we ended up winning the treble, and uh, you know I was top scorer, 27 goals that season from midfield. And I was quite surprised because Jock Wallace, actually, uh, the manager, when he signed me, he, he shook my hand and he said, uh, welcome to the club, Gordon. He says, that's taken a while. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I've been trying to sign you for the last four years. Did you not know? And I said, no, I didn't know. And he said, I've been in for you for four years. And I said, well, I, that's funny you say that because I was going to ask you why have you signed me because you've just signed David Cooper and I'm playing in the wing at Kilmarnock, which I was at the time. He said, no, when I first saw you play, you were playing midfield. And I said, that's where I'm going to play you. You're going to play, and he actually said an amazing thing. He said, "You're the last piece of the jigsaw." That's what he actually said to me, and I was thinking, "What does that mean?" And that he put me in the midfield, and we played uh, a great system. We played four-three-three, and uh, we had two wingers in McLean and Cooper, and then with Derek Johnson zone up front, and we had three in midfield. Harley Embry was playing that way in those days, but it, it worked out really specially, and we won the treble. There you go. Now you spent three seasons at Rangers and left for Brighton Hove Albion. How did that come about, Gordon? Well, it was, it was a strange one. Uh, John Gregg was now the manager of Rangers and um, I had just signed a five-year contract a month earlier. So the season had just finished. We're in June and John Gregg phoned me and he said, look, he said, uh, Brighton have been trying to sign you all year. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, Alan Mullery, the manager, is a big friend of mine. Will you go down and speak to him? He said, I don't want you to sign. Don't go, but go and speak to him as a favour. And I said, OK. So this is June. The season's finished. So I go down uh, and flew down and got my flights and all that. Never thought anything about it, but Davy Proven, who was a Rangers coach at the time, was assistant to John Gregg, came with me. So we went in and uh, Alan Mullery met me and he said, look, I've been trying to sign you. I said, well, I found that out. He goes, really keen to get you. Made me an offer. Uh, and now the offer, the first offer he made me was double the wages I was on at Rangers. And I said, no, because I wasn't going. And he said, well, and he'll sign on to you. And, I said, and then he upped the offer and I'm saying, no. Good bit, a little bit of chat about where he wanted me to play and all that. Up the offer again. I said, no. We're now at three times my Rangers wages and uh, quite a bit of sign on fee as well. And I still said no. And Alan Mullery said, look, go and have lunch, Gordon. He said, we'll have a chat after lunch. So I go for lunch with David Proven, just the two of us. And uh, David Proven said to me, he says, that's some money, Gordon. I went, I know that's unbelievable. He says, like three times the money I'm on at Rangers. He said, are you not thinking of taking that? I went, David, you know I'm not taking it. He goes, all right, I might as well tell you. The deal's done. I went, yeah. I said, what do you mean the deal's done? He said, well, we've sold you. We've accepted the money. I said, that's not what John Gregg said to me. He says, well, that's the situation. We thought, he said, that we would, you would take the money because it was more than you were on at Rangers. And it's really good. We knew you were going to get better money. We thought you would take it. And I said, well, I'm not signing. So I then phoned Ibrox and John Gregg lifted the phone. And I said, look, I said, boss, I said, uh, what's what's happening here? He goes, have you signed yet? And I said, no, I'm not signing. And he goes, yes, yeah. And I said, I'm not. And he says, you will. He says, if you don't sign, he says, you're going to have a hard time. I'll never, you're not playing the first team again. So you won't even play in the reserves. He said, it'll make your life very difficult. I'll have you in morning and night training. And I said, I can't believe this. And he said, well, that's the story. Now, at the time, I didn't know, Jed, that it was a, a record fee Rangers got for me. It was £440,000 they got for me, which was a lot of money, a lot more than they paid for me. And, and I didn't realise that that was the situation. But I, I, I did realise at the time that I've got to sign here. I can't. And I went back to Alan Mulligan and I said, I've had a think about it after lunch and uh, I'll sign. Now, it was great. The money was better. Now, I had a lovely time in Brighton. I really enjoyed it, and it turned out to be great. So I met John Gregg since. I don't feel anything against him at all. I, said, I didn't like the way he did it, but I have to say he did me a favour, and uh, I went there and had a good time down in Brighton. Sorry to mention it, Gordon, but you're best remembered, even though you scored a fantastic header for the opening goal in that mm -hmm. FA Cup final against Manchester United, but you're remembered for the miss. Does that still play in your mind? Uh, I'm afraid it does, yeah. It's one of these things that at the time it didn't as much because I was a professional player and you got to go on your career and you have to accept it and I was annoyed with myself. My teammates were okay with me. The manager, Jimmy Mealio, was fine with me and that was good. A lot, a lot of the fans were a bit annoyed, as you might imagine. Brighton can win the FA Cup. But as, as time's going on, it's felt a lot worse, you know. Um, I just felt that, uh, you know, it was a great chance to win the game. Last minute of extra time. And, it, you know, there'd be no way back from Manchester United if I'd scored, although I put his 1-0 up. I always remember walking off that day, looking up at the scoreboard at half-time, and it was it was Brighton 1, Manchester United 0, and under Brighton it said Smith, and I thought, I'm going to be remembered for today then now after that. <laughs> and I am unfortunately remembered. But as I say, it's one of these things, I don't, you can't take any away from it. I should have scored. I, I, Gary Bailey made the save, 
but I just I still feel it's a bad miss and I still take full responsibility. So it's one of these things you have to accept in your life, Jed. You know, it's not always plain sailing. There can be downsides and it's how you deal with it is an important thing. Yeah, fair play to you, Gordon, but not not many people can say that they actually played in an FA Cup final, let alone score. Now, apart from that, was your time in Brighton, was it was a memorable experience, Gordon? It was. As I say, I really enjoyed it. it was, I went down there, uh, as I say, didn't think I was going there, but it was, it was a change of life for me in a lot of ways. Brighton's a lovely place to live. Um, we actually lived, we actually bought a house which was walking distance to the football stadium. So on a match day on a Saturday, we, many other players, wherever they're, they're playing all around the country, actually walked to the game. But we had a few players that could do that because they all lived in the same area in Hove. We all used to walk, walk to the match on a Saturday. So it was a lovely place to live. But uh, there was two things I took up down there, which I, I'd never done before, was golf, because the weather was so good. And drinking was the other one I took up. <laughs> I couldn't believe the atmosphere. The first night out with the boys... Uh, Jed, they, uh, they said to me, what, we're having a drink. And I said, what are you having? I went, I'll have a Coke. And they went, no, we're having a drink. So I went, yeah, Coca-Cola. And they said, you don't drink? I said, no. So they went to the bar, came back with all the drinks, put them down. Where's mine? I said, they said, we don't buy soft drinks. That was you. Get your own. So first few nights out with them, I'm going I'm, to, I'm having to buy my own drink. I was my own kitty until one night I said, like, I'll have a shandy. For that. And I said that. And we went, I got a round of applause. And that was me starting. I was 25 years of age. I'd never drunk alcohol in my life. I just didn't think footballers should drink. But there was quite a big drinking culture down yeah. there. There really was. A lot of people always think Scotland was worse. It was nothing at Rangers and Kilmarnock. It was nothing like what it was in Brighton. But because we all lived handy to each other, you know, it was a very, very social atmosphere. And, and, and the players were with each other all the time, even after games and before and travelling and all that thing. So, so it was a really friendly atmosphere and as I say I took up drink because of that. There you go. After Brighton Hove Albion you were transferred to Manchester City where you played under the late great Billy McNeil. What was that like Gordon? It was very interesting because Billy had uh, tried to sign me for Aberdeen and uh, he told me that and I was quite surprised with that and he, and he said he wanted to sign me so I, I went to play for him. I had every respect for him because I'd played against him and was obviously very much aware of the great career he'd had at Celtic being a you know, he'd been a manager, but he'd also been a captain, winning the European Cup and all that. And I got on great with him. But there was one or th once or twice where the arguments, you know, it, it, it was always happens with me and managers. <laughs> that was my mum's fault for getting me educated at times. It was like, you know, because I remember one time he, he was having a go at us after one of the games, and it was early January. And, and, and I always remember this, Jerry, he said, uh, in front of all, he said, you know, you know what? He said, this club gave you all a, a free gift at Christmas, and that's how you, you react, how you play. And I said to him, boss, we got a free gift at Christmas. He went, yeah. And I said, what other kind of gift can you get? Right? Oh, that one never <laughs> <down imagine>, well. <laughs> You imagine that went down. Yeah, yeah. A week later, I was dropped out of the team. So we were playing it. We are playing a game, and I get I get left out. And uh, he, he, at half time, we're losing 1 0. And at half time, he was having a go at all the players. And he suddenly turned and looked at me and he went, well, oh, I can see by your face you think you should be playing. So what did he say to that? And I went, well, yeah. And he goes, oh, you think so? And I went, yeah. And he goes, oh, you think you can change this game? I said, hopefully I can. Yeah. And he goes, right, get changed. You're going on. So he put me on at half time and um, I made the equaliser and scored the winner. We won 2 1. And he came in after the game and he said, that's a lot better. I can't believe how we played in that first half. Oh, I can see by your face you think you won that game for us. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think I did okay. Oh, well, I saw about you. That's what he said. And I, what happened was, it was funny. The next day we walked into the, we went to the state, we're still training the next day. And his office, he walked, had to walk by his office, going to the main road. And uh, over here was Gordon, he shouted at me, and I was like, what? He goes, come in. Just want to say, well done last night. That was great. And I went, do you know I said that last night, boss? He went, I didn't want to make a fuss in front of all the other players. Yeah. I won't be dropping you again. You'll be playing every week. That's what he said. So yeah. after, we got in great, really did. And even after he, we, we met up again, after he, he, his career, he came back up to Scotland and all that. I always got on really well with him. That, that's the mark, man. He was a, he was a great man. Yeah. Gordon, after City, you made the big decision to play in Austria and then Switzerland. What made you decide to continue your career abroad? Well, when I got the offer to go to Austria, I just felt it would be an interesting place to go. It was a, a club in Vienna, which was obviously the capital city, and I thought that would be interesting to go and live abroad and experience a international football or a European football because I'd always wanted to be a manager. I'd already ambitioned at that time to get into the management side of the game. And I thought it would be a great idea to, to pick up exactly how teams train, how they play, different tactics and all that sort of thing. And also just to live in another country and experience that because, uh, you know, it's something you never really think about in the early part of your career. You're going to go abroad. So I went to Austria there and it was interesting. I went, the club I went to, uh, Admira Vaca, were actually uh, an amalgamation of two clubs. 
and uh, their, their crowds, basically the two clubs that amalgamated, about 8,000 people going to their games, the two clubs amalgamated and the crowd then was 6,000. So because a lot of people just did not associate with the new club. So the crowd had dropped right down. And uh, so what happened was we're over there and it was a great thing. One one thing that was good about it, at first, not, not one of my teammates or the manager then, they could speak English. I had to learn German and I had to learn it quickly. And, and that was great for me because if, it, if your teammates also could speak English, they would be trying to practice their English on you. But I, I learned German fairly quickly. So that was a great aspect of it. And what happened was the club was short of money. And that's the reason why I had a two-year contract. I was there about 15 months and the club actually asked me to go because they were short of paying me. Uh, but they, they'd given me a nice salary and I had a good, I had a, a flat from the club, a car, but they were struggling money-wise. And the three foreign players they had in, myself and, and two Yugoslav players, one Croatian, one Serbian, we were all asked to leave because we were obviously the, the highest earners there, and we did. But it was a shame because I did enjoy it there. I enjoyed living in, in Vienna. But uh, the agent who'd take me there got me FC Basel. He said, Basel were interested. Are you willing to go to Switzerland? The good thing about it was it was a German part of Switzerland, which meant that because I could already speak the language, it was helpful to go over there. And, and it was great because I fitted in right away because I could speak uh, German and when I went to play for Basel. Despite having played at the highest level, Gordon, in four different countries, scoring over 100 league goals, you were never chosen to play for Scotland. How do you feel about that looking back today? It was a bit of a disappointment at the time, but uh, you know, a couple of things came home to me. Billy McNeil actually told me that uh, John, uh, that Jock Steen, the manager, was, Jock Steen was, was a bit annoyed about me because he thought I'd turned down uh, Celtic to go to Rangers because I didn't realise it that at the time. Billy McNeil told me he was in for me with, with Aberdeen and so was Jock Steen at Celtic when I signed for Rangers. Kamarna had a bid from the three clubs and Jock Steen was always of the impression that I had turned down Celtic, which I hadn't because uh, you know the Rangers thing was the only one I was, I was offered. But the, th the other side of it was that um, I, I fell out with Ali McLeod on an under-21 trip. We, we, we had a bit of an argument on the bus. Once again, that's my problem, falling out <laughs> with Manchester. And uh, we had a bit of an argument on the bus just before going to a match. So he didn't play me then. And it was a very interesting thing. That was I was at Brighton my first season there. And I was at a function one night. And I'm walking past the table uh, at a function. And this, all I heard was Gordon. And I turned around. It was the England manager, Ron Greenwood. He was there. And he, and he said to me, I just want to say to you, he said, I've seen you a few times. He said, I'm really sorry I'm not English. And I went, really? And he goes, he goes if you were English, he said, you've been my squad. No, no, he didn't. He said, you've been, he said, you've been my squad. And then he went, no, you wouldn't. You've been my team. That's what he said. He, he, I said, you'd pick me. He goes, I would have you every minute. I can't believe Scotland aren't picking you. That was Ron Greenwood said that to me, the former West Ham manager, now England manager. And from that moment, I actually was relaxed about it because then I thought, it is just down to opinion. If somebody doesn't think you're good enough, you're not. There was a lot of high standard of players at that time in Scotland. Scotland were qualifying for, for major tournaments at the time. But nevertheless, I still felt I, I could have had a chance to play for Scotland. But I played under 21s, played youth team, but I never got a chance to play for the full team. But I had to accept it. After you returned from Switzerland, you retired as a player. What career path did you then pursue? Well, what happened was I did a lot of work because of the fact I'd done a degree in business. I did a lot of work in, in terms of I going to did courses when I was at Man City and Brighton to try and, and improve my knowledge of different businesses. And I, and I got quite a few offers because I obviously was a graduate as well of uh, working for financial services companies. So that's what I started. I went into financial services at that time became an independent advisor, uh, left it for three years to go to St Mirren as assistant manager, went back into the independent world, and I was working for a big firm of chartered accountants when they actually said they wanted to start an agency business. So we brought in an agent, and we, we actually had an agency business. Then that agent left to go back into football as a scout, and they actually asked me to become the, the agent. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure about it. I was a financial advisor. I said, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I should become an agent as well. They said, you can do the job. And I did it and enjoyed it so much and built up the business that I went independent. I took it on my own and became an agent in my own right and uh, built up my business as a football agent. As a football agent, do you feel that that was a worthwhile occupation and a career you would recommend to MD watching? I think it was. I think it's very important that you, you've got a knowledge of the game, Jed, because I think that it's a big help that you've got the contacts to speak to people. You also, I was always of the impression as well, and the big problem with some agents, and, and I, the agent's got a bad name, but they don't all deserve it. But some of them are basically interested more in money 
and sometimes they take they make the player interested in money as well more than anything else and I always did spoke to my players and always gave them advice that the first thing they should be interested in is their career and if the career is correct the money will come with it but do the right thing go to the right club don't go to a big club too early if you're young when you're maybe going to go to another big club and just become a, a reserve player or a squad player play and build your career first I used to give that advice I wasn't so much interested in the, in the money from it as I was in helping the people and I think that that's that's the way to do it because I felt that if I had an agent during my time, I might have taken better decisions or, or things might have been better for me in that respect, the advice you get and all that sort of thing. So I think agency, agents are, are the correct people to, to look after players, but they're not all, as I say, doing the right thing due to a lack of experience in a lot of cases. In 2007, you got to the pinnacle of Scottish football when you are named CEO of the SFA. Now, what were your experiences, Gordon, of holding such a high position within the Scottish game? Yeah, it was quite interesting because uh, I didn't apply for the job. Um, I had met uh, the, the president, George Peat, um, one day at Hamden, and he said to me, are you applying for the job? And I said, no. And he said, why not? I said, I said I'm not, not interested, you know. And he goes, I think you should apply for it. I said, no. And then I got an agency got in touch with me. Uh, they said, uh, recruitment agency, and said, you know, we've been told that we'd like you to come along for an interview. And I said, when's the interview? They said, Friday uh, at Hamden. I said, no, I'm not coming. I said, why not? I said, well, because people will know why I'm there, that I'm in for the job. And if I don't get it, I'll be kind of embarrassing. They said, okay. They phoned me back an hour later and said, your interview's on Monday in our offices. So I had a separate interview and then I got offered the job. It was one of those ones I thought myself, it was, should I do this? Because everything was going well at the time. I was working in the media, uh, basically BBC full time uh, with, with all the, the radio and television. I had an agency business that was going well. I had a lot of top players uh, under my, my belt. So it was one of those ones that was my head and my heart, really. So in the end up, I just thought, uh, the heart said, let's let's go into Scottish football and see if I, can, if I can change things around. And that's why I decided in the end up to take the job. Finally, Gordon, you've had a varied and most certainly interesting career in life. Now, you must have met quite a few famous people over your years. Probably the, the greatest experience of my life was, was meeting somebody. I was at Rangers at the time, just before I left. I met, I met Paul McCartney at a concert one night, I got introduced to him and, uh, after the show, and he always said, oh, I'd love to come and see you play someday. So I got in touch when I went to Brighton and uh, said, well, I, I'm closer to you now because I know you live in Sussex, which you did. Uh, I can come, you can come to a game. Uh, the next thing was I was invited to a, a, a Linda McCartney photograph exhibition and he actually said, when I met him that night, he said, oh, I'm sorry I've not been to see you play. Why don't you come and visit me? You live me, near me, don't you? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, come down, visit me any Sunday. So I went down to, we went with the family to his house down in, in Pease Marsh in Sussex. And I went in and it was a fantastic day, Jed. I sat all afternoon just sitting, chatting to him about things. My wife and, and Linda, his wife at the time, were, were, were just chatting away as well in, an, in another room. But Paul and I just sat and we chatted through loads of things, football, music, business and all that. And during that period, he said to me at one point, he said, uh, do you, you, into music, do you play yourself? I said, I play guitar. He goes, oh, do you? I said, yeah. And he goes, do you play any of my stuff? And I went, I do a few of your songs. He goes, what ones? And I named a few songs. One of them was Blackbird, right? And he was, do you play Blackbird? He said, he said, I get loads of musicians asking me. I said, well, I couldn't work it out. I said, a good friend of mine, Dave Shaw, who did, was a musician, and he, he actually worked out how you played it, and he showed me. He suddenly got up out of the seat, went out of the room, came back in with his guitar, sat down across from me and sang Blackbird to me while I was sitting there. I couldn't believe it. And I was like, ah. see, at the time, I never appreciated it as much even as I do now. I think one of the Beatles singing to him here. The fortunate thing for me was it was a left-handed guitar because he's left-handed, so he couldn't get me to play, you see. So he had to play it. But the funny thing was when he finished, he, went, he said, is that how you play it? I went, a bit better than that, Paul. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> he did laugh. He did laugh. Oh. But it was a great experience. I met him again a couple of years ago uh, through a contact. Um, he found out I, I, I found out someone who was working with him uh, for his, his tour, and uh, he invited me as his guest to my wife and I to, to um, the, the hydro as his guest, and we met him before the show, and it was fantastic to meet him again after all years. He remembered that day being in my house and, and being in his house and visiting and playing the guitar and all that. He was a great he's a great guy, and I, I say probably I would say of all the even all the p great people in football I've met. He's probably my biggest hero, and it was a, a delight to, to know him and to meet him and for him to sing a song to me. It was fantastic. 
Well, Gordon, that'll be a hard story to beat, that's for sure. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. That's our show for Chit Chat with Jed Co, the show where everyone has their say from the Go Glasgow Urban Hotel. Could you please subscribe free to our YouTube channel and give us a like. Thank you for watching.